Welcome to the Patron Saints of Pop Culture Podcast. I'm Miguel Cabrubius. And I am Kathy Cabrubius. And today, let's talk about the Netflix original, The Umbrella Academy, Season 1. Yeah, I am, I'm glad that they just announced that uh, they're getting a Season 2. But, well, why wouldn't uh, they? I mean, yeah. did you see the finale? <laughs> it, was, it was fantastic. And, uh, well, before we get there, uh, spoiler alert for those of you who have not yet... Uh, seen the show mm-hmm. or have experienced the uh, worldwide phenomena that is the Umbrella Academy, uh, why haven't you yet? Yeah. Yeah, get on that. I mean, I was kind of, I don't know why I was kind of hesitant to watch it at first. I think it's because with all of the hype, I'm always kind of nervous to watch things yeah. that are super hyped up. But then there was a lot of people who I trusted who liked The show, I mean, everybody has that one person that you're like, okay, if they like it, it must, it must be pretty good. And then you always have that other person who's like, I didn't like it. And you're like, well, then it must be good because they didn't like it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That kind of happened with uh, the Umbrella Academy. So I'm glad that we ended up watching it. Yeah. um, Well, we'll get there. Uh, So uh, let's uh, do our summary and review. Mm -hmm. Um, It's really hard to summarize this in a short uh, kind of a concise thing. Um, Do you want to like piggyback off of each other until we fill all the holes? <laughs> well, I was just basically going to say a family of adopted superheroes drifts apart and uh, finds the true meaning of family while stopping the apocalypse. Did you feel my eye roll there? <laughs> the true meaning of family. Well, we will be talking about that later anyway, but... Um, Oh, gosh. I don't know what else to say. Oh, I'll do the second half. So um, two investigators from the future are set to try to correct the present. No, keep the present as is. Yeah, is keep, the, yeah. yeah keep the present as is. There we go, right? Yeah. That's, that's also a thing that happened. Yeah. Yeah. This, the second half, because their storyline is also pretty interesting. I'm kind of sad we're not focusing on that now that I think about it. Yeah, there's there's a lot that there was a lot in there. Um, yeah. We could have done a, a two parter for this one, but uh, we felt that uh, we needed to talk about other things first. There's a lot that uh, we have recently watched and wanted to talk about that uh, we. We're just not going to have time to get to everything. No, I mean, this will definitely, I mean, there, heck, I do want to talk about Hazel now. Now I'm like regretting my topic a little bit. So maybe in the future when, if we have some space, we'll we'll come back. We'll throw out a a part two. (laughs) Well, we're going to finish, I'm pretty sure we're going to finish with both uh, parts of the OA by the end of this season. Yeah. So we may go back and do episode by episode for the Umbrella Academy uh, in season four of our podcast. And we have a lot of seasons lined up already. Well, I mean, we've already done more than 100 episodes. So. Yay for us! Yeah! See, and I think we just keep getting better and better. Oh, just like cheese and wine gets better with age. Sure. Sure! <laughs> Um, I really enjoyed it. It is, it, uh, as many people have been saying, it is very... Uh, dissimilar to the marvel formula that has been uh well netflix mm-hmm. and marvel's uh television so- show formula that has been on uh this platform which uh i don't think is a bad thing mm-hmm. at all like it, this is netflix flexing their muscles and saying you know what disney we didn't need you yeah we can have our own superheroes yeah <laughs> and they're going to be much more interesting than yours yeah well the thing is um The Umbrella Academy isn't as well known. I mean, for example, when it comes to Iron Man, even people who didn't read the comics knew who Iron Man was and knew some parts of his story. With the Umbrella Academy, so many people are coming in completely blind, and so it seems more refreshing to them that way. Well, Dark Horse Comics isn't really one of the big big two, DC or Marvel, and so... Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of fringe comic fans are you know excited about it, and like me, who you know I didn't really see the worth of comics until a few years ago. That you know it was it was much more 
much more inviting to the human condition than uh, both Marvel and DC have have kind of strayed away from. Yeah, yeah. But it also has some elements, too, that are, like, a little kooky and a little weird. Yeah. Which definitely are in DC and Marvel as well, too. So it has enough familiar elements to where it's not going to completely alienate people who are already superhero fans. And by the way, if you were a uh, big emo kid in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, you know who wrote these comics as well as uh, the uh, Into the Spider-Verse uh, series for Marvel. It's uh, Gerard Way. From My Chemical Romance, which I guess even if you weren't an emo kid, you would have thought, well, you know, emo band, My Chemical Romance. But knowing that now, after, you know, watching the series, you're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you could say that uh, Klaus was definitely an emo kid. What are you talking about? He's just a big ray of sunshine, Miguel. <laughs> Well, with the uh, the heavy eye makeup and everything, you know. Yeah, the tattoos on the palms of his hands. And the uh, the uh, um, leather pants mm-hmm. with the uh, the Huge what do boots. you call them? Like Platforms? see-through windows? No, on the pants, like on the sides that go down. Oh, I don't know what you're talking. I wait. I know what you're talking about. I don't know what they're named. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, have. So if you haven't guessed, I guess you guys know now that we like it. Have we even gotten that far yet? (laughs) No, we're at the review. I'm saying that I liked it. Okay. That was my review. (laughs) Okay. So are you done with your review? Yes, I'm done with my review. Okay. Um, Well, I liked it. Saying that again. Um, I thought it, again, was very refreshing in terms of the superhero genre that I am used to. Uh, I also liked it, too, that you kind of also f- started to like the some villains as well, too, mm-hmm. but not in the way that Marvel makes you sympathize with yeah. the villains. Like, here in the Umbrella Academy, like, Hazel, I was like, he's a real dude. Like, like he's a guy, he just wants to settle down and start a family and eat great donuts. You know? Yeah, he just wants to be with Donut Lady. Yeah, he just, you know, he just wants to live a good life and stop running around. And I'm just like, and yeah. killing people. Yeah, and killing people. Um, but that is something that I can, and everybody can sympathize with. I mean, that's especially the donut part. Yeah, I really want to stop killing people. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I liked, I as I said, I, I kind of like their take on getting people to sympathize with the villains because it's definitely a different take versus, you know, Killmonger, for example. Yeah. Well, yeah, instead of the fanaticism that... uh, You you understand where he's coming from, but he's going about it the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah. These guys, I mean, you shouldn't be killing people anyway, but you can tell they have a heart of gold inside, I guess. That's kind of weird to say. It's, (laughs) It's almost the next logical step for... Uh, for narrative in itself and yeah, and storytelling is instead of these fanatics that you know have these you know dead set on their ways it's more of a an everyday you know just the layman going about their daily work and they're just doing it because it's their work mm-hmm. and you know they're just following their boss's orders yeah yep and uh you know and i think that's i think especially now that uh, millennials are getting older uh, that uh, that's that's definitely what we will sympathize more with is those people who didn't end up doing what they wanted to do with their lives. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think that is the next logical step in most storytelling. So I think this is like one of the first to kind of eke that out mm-hmm. in a good way. Well, and two, I think something that you what you had said just now kind of also made me think that a lot of millennials are ending up having to work for companies that aren't so great. Yeah. And so they're doing the work of, like, the major villain, but they're still just the everyday, like, guy. You know what I mean? Well, and... So uh, they're not the real villain. They're not the real villain. Yeah, we're not going to talk about, uh, you know, 
the just following orders and and stuff like that. There's uh, other podcasts that do that much better. Mm-hmm. Um, I really recommend. Uh, I think it was Radio Lab who did uh, a series on that one experiment where they uh, have to shock people in the other room. Oh yeah, and uh, it was just fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, series on that. And uh, I really recommend checking that out. Mm-hmm. Anyway, speaking of new this storytelling This is probably the methods, longest intro we've had in a very long time. Yeah, so I, I know. apologize, everybody. <laughs> we just really like the show. We really wanted to talk about how much we like the show. <laughs> and so if you've been listening to our podcast this season, uh, season three of uh, Patron Saints of Pop Culture. Oh, is that what we're on? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you notice that there's been a theme for me as a, as a human being, and this is... Primarily because this is a lot of what's going through my mind and, and a lot of what I'm going through at this point in time in my life um, is especially trying to find the unique me, the Miguel that is Miguel, rather than the Miguel that I've been trying to portray to everybody for years, you know, and uh, and the reason why I bring this up is because that's so much what I pulled out from... Uh, the Umbrella Academy is was that uh, you have these supers who are just tired of being super, and they're they're wanting to have people just well, except kinda... for Diego. Yeah, except for Diego, but Diego's got his own issues. Yeah, <laughs> uh, is that they're wanting people to see them for who they are uniquely them, and D- Diego he doesn't really get this until like midway through the season. Uh, after the death of uh, um, his girlfriend, his girlfriend, not really his girlfriend anymore. Detective lady, yeah, the detective Sorry. lady. Um, and I think this is this is true for a lot of people, but especially for those of us who were in uh, ministry or those positions that were set apart, that were seen as other, or were seen as super, were seen as, and you know, it, it can go for people like celebrities can go for people who have, you know, some modicum of fame. Mm-hmm. Um, that includes like YouTube or podcasters or... Uh, Not us, though. Local radio personalities. <laughs> um, and you probably know somebody like this. You probably know somebody who has that you can tell that it, they're not real. Mm-hmm. That they're they're just fake when they're around people. And it's not it's not maybe primarily their own fault. But it's because they're they have that persona that they have to maintain. Yep. Now, now for me, this is this was a lot of me was that I I believed that I was the persona for the longest time, and you know that's because I didn't have that chance to be anything other than than that. That's what people expected of me. That's what people wanted from me, and I mean it's so hard. Uh, for those people who are set apart, especially when they're told that when they're expected to be super all the time, that they end up believing the lies that they tell themselves when they're by themselves is that they're not really that, that they're really just worthless. They're, they're worn out. They're, they're not effective at whatever it is that they're doing. They're not really super. And, you know, I you can see this in Allison. Allison portrays this a lot. You know, right away, Luther's still trying to figure out Luther. Well, yeah, I mean, he kind of went through something else. Yeah, and <laughs> and see, I think Luther Luther's storyline could have been so much better, but I think it was it was very lacking. Uh, I think part of it is because he's not the brightest crayon in the box. <laughs> That's true, but. Like for him, it was just I'm gonna I'm just gonna do this, mm-hmm. and it was none of his own self reflection. Now they can take that further in season two, definitely. When you know, because he didn't really find out a lot of this stuff, like the fact that he was sent to the moon for nothing uh, near the till the near the end of the season, and he just got angry instead of just you know trying to figure out. Okay, well then, what makes me unique? What's what's the Luther that's Luther? Well, he's part. He's now part monkey, so I would say that makes him unique. Yeah. Um, for for Klaus, I think that's that's a big part of his story arc. 
that uh, you know, then he embraces who he is, and that's what then makes him super at mm-hmm. the end there. And I have to say that that end sequence where he's where he's channeling Ben or whatever you, you want to call that that he's doing is just brilliant. Like it's beautiful. Anyway, sorry, I'm getting going. I'm not going to go back to the review. Um, but I, I want to ask you the question: Did you feel splash off from that of? Uh, of you know that expectation placed upon me that you know people maybe expected more of you or set you apart because you were you know the youth minister's wife oh i rejected it wholeheartedly like i am not the type of person who if you put me in a category i'm not going to follow it like that's for example growing up as being labeled well i'm blonde and so along with that, I got a lot of dumb blonde jokes, but I am definitely not your ditzy, dumb, blonde scenario. Like, I don't fit into that type. And so I, growing up with that, when I married you and became your wife and thus the youth minister's wife, I totally rejected it. I was like, nope, you're not going to put me into the circumstance. And I told the churches, too, that you worked for, like, I'm not going to be making you cookies. I'm not going to be volunteering. Like I'm, I'm going to be doing what I want to do. If you I want to my join, husband, not me. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So, um, but I also kind of had some practice with that, I guess, since my family members. I mean, my mom worked for the church, as you guys probably know. My grandpa did. So I've been like the deacon's granddaughter and the child's minister or the children's minister's daughter Mm -hmm. and so i already had those labels placed on me and i just didn't want them anymore now this is this is a very interesting take on it this is something that's that's placed on them as children and like you could see it from whenever they're adopted like most of them were from very early babyhood that uh you know he adopted them so, I mean, what effect does this have on children? Like, it really got to screw you up when this when this happens, that you're expected to be super. So what kind of um, effect do you think it, it had has on children to have such large expectations placed upon them? Well, the, immediately I think of the kids who are gifted at a young age, what kind of pressure is put upon them because at first when your child is founded as being gifted a lot of the times the the talent or whatever it is comes Mm -hmm. really easy to them at first but then there's always a certain point in time as they grow up that either other people catch up to them or they you know start getting a rebellious streak and just something like stops them or they don't necessarily seem as special at a certain point in time, you know, because like, you know, you can have those kids who get those doctorates when they're 16, but there could be people who get their doctorate later in life who end up actually being smarter than the kid who actually get it, got their doctorate at 16. Yeah. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. so like you have that pressure at a young age of trying to keep up and still being the best and the brightest that you can be. And it's hard. I mean, it's, I can imagine it being very stressful. Well, um, I'll talk about this more in a minute, but uh, I, I mean, especially in my own experience with the children of pastors and priests and other religious leaders, they tend to be like they tend to be the worst people that I have ever met. Um, like there are some there are some cases that like, no, they're actually some of the best people I've ever met. But then there's there are some that you're like, yeah that expectation really did kind of screw them up. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, I guess that's one of the reasons why I rejected the idea of being the dutiful youth minister's wife because I'd already had that kind of pressure on me as a kid. And luckily, I had enough cousins and siblings around to where it wasn't fully, like, on me to Mm -hmm. be that person. So I was able to, like, uh, mess up more than, you know, your typical youth ministers or um, kid, I guess, or whatever. I'm trying to think of what I... I don't really have them. I don't really have, like, a name. 
Yeah. When I was a kid, the Deacon's granddaughter. The Deacon's granddaughter. Yeah. It sounds like a uh, Nicholas Sparks uh, book ugh, or something. Gross. Um, <laughs> ugh. I mean, I still, I still did have like that pressure of like I still had to be a good Catholic and I still had to, you know, yeah, represent my faith enough. But I didn't have to be like the faithiest person of faith yeah (laughs) the the most faith the the most faithful of the faithful (laughs) yes i did not have to be that person yeah so i think that that pressure really drives people to find bad ways of coping with with bad circumstances like uh, for instance when this is where i said i was going to be coming back to in just a minute i'm there so uh like for instance Children stars, people who grew up as, uh, you know, childhood celebrities and stuff like this. You you can see it. Like, it's public for all the world, their, mm-hmm. their downfall. Well, they go of one of two ways. It's either they know the downfall is could happen. Yeah. And so they either drop from the limelight. So they're not – so if they do have a out, like, a downfall, it's not as drastic. As public, yeah. yeah. Or they just go headlong into it and they're just going to be like, if I'm going to be a train wreck, I'm going to be the most explosive train wreck. (laughs) Yeah, it's – there's been a lot of uh, just complete train wrecks from that. And, uh, I mean, there have been some who have turned it around. Um, Definitely, like, there are some, like, comeback stories. Like, uh, Robert Downey Jr. is one of them. I mean, mm-hmm. he's Iron Man now. So. Well, and Britney Spears, too. I oh, mean, yeah. say what you will about her, but she definitely is in a much better place than she was in the 2000s. Well, here's here's another one. Like, she should have been my prime example, but Jessica Simpson. Not only was she was a youth minister's daughter, but she was also a child celebrity. Mm-hmm. So that's a twofer there. Yeah. Like, super pressured. And, you know... Now she's not really in the limelight anymore, but, you know, that was kind of, she had that old reality TV show, was which was a say, bad thing. And yeah, that TV show wasn't the, the best. So who out of all of the seven Umbrella Academy kids do you feel has the best coping mechanisms? Mm. Well... I'm trying to think. Obviously, Klaus is a no. <laughs> no um, well, yeah. Gosh. In and out of rehab. Yeah. I mean, at least Vanya, like, she was able to pick up music. And mm-hmm. even though growing up, she didn't believe herself to be super. And she's not the greatest, you know, violin player. At least she still has the violin to spark joy in herself. Mm -hmm. Like you can tell she still likes to play and she still enjoys teaching people and that kind of stuff. So I guess it would be Vanya, in my opinion. All right. And at the beginning of the series, I should say. Yeah, I would, I would probably agree with you on that. And well, and I think that she probably hides the, hides it a little bit better than the others. Um, well, she well not really. She wrote a tell-all book. That's not really hiding how you feel. <laughs> no, I mean that she hides her bad coping mechanisms better mm. than the other ones. Yeah, the bad coping mechanisms usually, like in her, it was more or less believing somebody who gave her the the slightest bit of attention, and especially for I mean that's a huge bad like no no coping mechanism that yep. that like a lot of us who grew up with that. That pressure and those of us who dealt with that pressure, you know, that that was our easy way to hide because, you know, nobody paid attention to us. So we did things to invite attention from probably the worst possible locations. Which probably explains why some of the pastor's kids are so tr- like big into being troublemakers. Oh, yeah. Um. Yeah, so I, I think that she just she just hit it better than the other ones, and, and I think that she's she dealt with it in her and that was her bad coping mechanism. Mm-hmm. And yeah, you know that's 
a lot of them, they, they all dealt with it in different ways. Diego was just, you know, continued to be that, even though it was, it was not the way that was needed anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he did have his big opening scene at the beginning where he, you know, saved that family or something. I can't remember. Yeah. But overall, I think the biggest takeaway from this is is that there is one way to deal with that pressure, and that's finding connection outside of those pressure cooker situations. Those situations that, you know, you, you're like so much pressure is placed upon you that you need to find a way out. Mm-hmm. You need to find something that's not a part that part of that world. We should mention healthy ways out. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, because we just talked about the bad <laughs> coping mechanisms. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, and part of the thing that, um, well, messed everybody up a little bit, let's be honest, is the family dynamics were very, very screwed up. Oh, yeah. I mean, let's just start off with the whole their father, like, obviously wasn't truly a father figure to them. You know, he was just like the live-in professor. Well, I mean, maybe they do parenting differently on whatever planet he's from. Well, I don't I don't know. He definitely was using them more as test subjects, in my opinion. Yeah. So if you're using a child as a t- test subject, you're probably not the best parent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's Just true. Just throwing that out there. But because he, he himself, even though he adopted these children, weren't really a good father figure to them. I mean, they did have... Grace, the mm-hmm. um, automaton. Yes, that's a, that's a good way of putting it. Yes. Um, or mom, as what they called her. I mean, she did kind of step in, but she, again, was programmed, you know, and so it still seemed kind of fake and phony. Yeah. In a way. You know, it, it was like, he was like, okay, so I'm going to watch all of these 50 TV shows. What do they say? equals a good mom and he programmed that into her <laughs> yeah like leave it to beaver mm-hmm. and yeah uh, she kind of is uh uh what's june cleaver is that yeah i have no idea i never wa- i mean i saw snippets of that show but i didn't really watch it um but because of that because they didn't have like good like i guess head of household figures That their sibling relationships, and let's face it, they are siblings. They are adopted by the same man, which makes them brothers and sisters, which makes it really creepy for Allison and Luther, in my opinion. (laughs) I also... Well, and too, I mean, we have have family members that are part of large families that have... That are are adopted. And so that would just gross me out if that were to happen. So weird and gross. Um... (laughs) Even though technically it's okay because they're not blood related. But anyway, we're not talking about that. Yeah, we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> um, so they didn't really have the opportunity or the structure to actually form real sibling relationships. They were more like close classmates, really. Yeah. And the one thing that really bothered me was that, or actually the one thing that um, kind of struck me as being somewhat normal in a large family is that you sometimes get that one sibling that's purposefully separated from the others. Mm -hmm. Um, You will sometimes see like the oldest sibling who has to basically act like the little mom or dad and take care of all the siblings. So they're set apart because they're not able to be as rambunctious and be as childlike as the other siblings like they may want to be. And then you can sometimes have it to where it's like in this scenario where the youngest is set aside and like almost overprotected. Yeah. Which again is not necessarily good because the youngest still ends up feeling like an outsider because they can't do all of the same things as the older kids can. Yeah. Um, so growing up, I know you didn't come from a, you know, super large family. But did you have, like, sibling groups, or did you guys pair off at all? Um, A little bit, um, primarily because uh, my sister is a slight bit older than uh, uh, my brother and I. So my brother and I were a lot closer than, uh, like, my sister was with either one of us. Mm -hmm. Um, And still kind of is, and I think it's, it's kind of been that way. 
a lot and it's you know we also shared a room so <laughs> oh yeah yeah that definitely helps um do you think that she ever became she was ever jealous at any point in time with the fact that you and your brother were closer than she was with the two of you mm, not really i think that she was more or less uh like jealous of the attention that we got from our parents hmm. but that's a that's a different story for a different day <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that's other things that happened yeah yeah um well i grew up in a slightly larger household by one i have um there's four of us four of us siblings and there's two older siblings and then there's two younger siblings so when we were growing up naturally the two older you know hung out and then the two younger help out but as we grew up, my older sister moved away across the country, and my younger sister and I just drifted apart. Like there was, my mom used to say that um, that I was the moon and she was the sun, hmm. and we were just we were kind of one in the same universe, but we were still yeah opposite. You know what I mean? And. When I moved in with my second older sister, if you guys can keep them straight now, um, we ended up getting closer because we spent way more time together while we were living together than when we were growing up together because she was much older. She wasn't in the household as much. She had a job. She had different school hours and that kind of stuff and after school activities. So I hardly ever like really had much time with her in the home when she lived in the home. So due to circumstances, like, I guess I would say her and I are probably closer now than she is with my oldest sister. And I'm definitely closer to her than my younger sister is. But now it's like the two of us are in the middle. But then the oldest and the youngest are, again, are like their own separate thing. But they don't, they're not actually in a group themselves. So they're still kind of separate from us. Mm-hmm. Um, which is, I don't know. I, I am kind of interested to see if there's any other families out there that are kind of structured the same way. But anyway, um, now, when parents, because there are times, and I've seen it, where parents like the professor. Is that what they called him? I don't remember. I know sometimes they called him dad, but kind of begrudgingly. Yeah. Um, there's sometimes when parents will force one sibling away from the others whether it to form them to be like a little parent or to be the overprotective younger sibling. And that is, I think that's really harmful. And we definitely found that with Vanya. (laughs) I mean, like, she still with them, you know, passing away and them all coming together. Like, they would still, like, talk, but she wasn't really, like, her opinion didn't Mm -hmm. matter, you know, I mean, just because she doesn't have powers doesn't mean that she doesn't have critical thinking skills, you know, so she still could have contributed, you know, to the conversation, to what was going on, but they still were just like, oh, no, she's she's still separate from us. Yeah, and I think that's what that's what led to her kind of her bad coping mechanism there, which was, I mean, and then her being easily manipulated, Mm -hmm. I mean... People can consider her to be the uh, antagonist of the show. I I really wouldn't. I would say more um, Harold Jenkins uh, <laughs> is uh, the uh, antagonist. He is, oh, oh, man. Yeah. Uh, it's just creepy thinking about it. Mm-hmm. He, uh, he uh, other Netflix original series, you'd her in the uh, show. Yeah. Well, and I kind of feel for Allison because, you know, she... You know, she saw that Vanya was, you know, upset and pulling away and was acting kind of strange. And, you know, being the good sister, you know, she said, I'm worried about you. I'm worried about this guy. He's kind of strange. And Vanya did what a lot of other younger siblings that I know have done and have just been like, well, you don't know me. You don't know my life. You're just jealous. You're not the boss of me. Exactly. (laughs) But that doesn't mean that even though they're same, they're the same age. I mean, obviously they have different life experiences. But just because the other siblings don't know your life and don't know you, in you know air quotes, 
doesn't mean that they aren't attuned to circumstances that you're blind to. Yeah. You know? So, um, even though she, I mean, I, I don't blame her for kind of writing off Allison because Allison now all of a sudden wants to be in her life. And I get that. Mm-hmm. You know, I get why she's, she's skeptical. Um, but you gotta, you gotta, you have to sometimes try to, to find where your siblings are coming from, like what kind of place they're coming from. Yeah. And decipher if their advice is really from the heart or not, I guess. Well, on both sides of it, I think, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's um, understanding that that the sibling may not take your advice to heart because you, you know, you haven't been there. This is the first time you're actually trying to be helpful. Mm-hmm. And, you know, then also realizing from the other sibling's point of view is that maybe they're trying to be helpful now because they're trying to make a connection finally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, man. And then you come from like me who has tried giving advice multiple times in the past. The advice was never taken to heart, even though surprise, surprise, life would have been easier if said advice was actually taken. Um, but then I just gave up. You know, at, at a certain mm-hmm. point in time, I'm like, I know you're going to run yourself ragged and like into the ground. I know this is a bad path that you're on, but I can't say anything anymore because I know it's just going to be a waste of air. And that's kind of frustrating. But what, am I, what are you going to do, right? Yeah. And, you know, I really feel that, yeah, well, the reaction from Vanya was obviously bad, but. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> I, at Slitting least, your sibling's I throat say, is... Just... At least nobody has sliced my throat from me giving <laughs> advice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so at least that hasn't happened. Um, but knowing that what we know about Vanya and the scenario and that kind of stuff, do you agree with how the others treated her? Or like, did you? was there ever a point in the series that you agreed with them? Because I know a lot of the times, no, I didn't agree with what they did. But... Is there any time when you're just like, yeah, I kind of, I kind of would have done the same thing or said the same thing? Uh, really? I don't think so. I think because you got to see a lot more of Vanya's world and Vanya's point of view that uh, you saw that, yeah, she really was kind of left out of a lot because, well, because... Uh, Professor, whatever his name is, or Hargreaves, yeah. uh, decided to be, um, well, withholding of our, you know, of everything. Lots of information, yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, the one part that I was like, I totally like jumped and was like, yes, 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 was when Diego was like, we can't just lock her away. <laughs> <You know>? Yeah. <laughs> if we're going to help her, we can't have her in there. Yes. Which is true. Yeah. So anyway... Lesson learned, listen to Diego. Um, for some things, not go, for Go, Diego, things. go. <laughs> when it comes to your sister having, um, discovering her powers, I mean, come on. Why did Luther, like, choke hold her and, like, make her pass out? I mean, she was coming to them for help. Yeah, see, another point where he was just angry. That was not, like, self-discovery or anything else no. like that. That was just, just pure anger. Like, he, like, yeah, Luther... And I don't think, I don't think Allison would have wanted her locked away. You know, I think if Allison at that point was able to talk to her her brothers, I think she would have told them, no, we need to help her. We need to, this is something new that she's discovering. We need to make sure that she doesn't explode the world. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I do, I, I would like to think that Allison would have done something better. Right. Well, I think that's all I have to contribute. Um, do you have anything else that you want to top off the episode with? Um, not really. I just want to ask that if you would like us to talk more about the Umbrella Academy and uh, talk more about, because there's a lot more that we obviously didn't get to here. Oh, yeah. Uh, please let us know and uh, we can let them know how to. Yes. Yeah, so um, you can um, follow us on Instagram on, and on Facebook at Patron Saints of Pulp Culture. Um, we also have Twitter at Real Honest Faith. And then finally, we also have a website too at thehonestfaith.com. 
So with all of that being said, we invite you to come and join the conversation. Bye.